Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Please join me in our call to worship. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We gather together to worship our Lord and Savior. For he alone is worthy of glory and our praise. Good morning. Good morning. We have a nice little shower in the morning. I tell you, it, it, it's been dry and every time it rains, I wake up and if I start falling asleep during church, it's because I was up at 3 o'clock this morning listening to the rain. But uh, it's, uh, it's nice to get a little bit of that. It, it's another beautiful day here. Uh, let's look at the events going on in the life of our church. Uh, today, there's a special offering. If you want to give toward uh, the Peace with Justice special offering, why today's the day you don't have to do it. Today you can plan for it on another day. We will get it in there. But that's, that's a special offering, one of the special offerings we do throughout the year. Uh, ladies are at Rouch's this month for breakfast on Saturdays at 8, and the guys are at the stadium. Uh, we, uh, if you, if you didn't get the email, if you didn't read the Facebook message, we had our board meeting last week and during the board meeting, we determined that, uh, we were going to follow along with the guidelines that have been set forth by the CDC. And I know a lot of you that aren't wearing masks today probably heard our, our, our decision, uh, that, uh, we made face masks opt optional. We're recommending them for anyone who hasn't been vaccinated. They are perfectly acceptable. If you want to err on the side of safety, we're still social distancing so that it is uh, helpful for those who haven't had a vaccination or, or for those who, uh, who may be health compromised. We still encourage people that uh, are you know, not feeling well or having some kind of uh, concern in their health that uh, maybe they should be watching us on Facebook or on our YouTube, but uh, that's part of uh, Part of the whole transition we're going through as we're entering back into some sense of normalcy, including our worship time. The other big announcement is that we sold all the tomato plants. So we sold, uh, by my best count, 199 tomato plants. And we made just short of uh, $900 doing it. So the check's been sent to uh, Rural Haiti Development Group, and uh, that money will be uh, distributed to pastors who are working in Haiti and doing some wonderful work. And, and I tell you, I, I had a meeting uh, the other night, a Zoom meeting, with a, a couple of ladies who are from a church in Texas who are working with one of those uh, one of those churches, one of the one of the missionaries in in, in uh, Haiti, and um, it's just. Uh, it, it's starting to turn into a, uh, a really wonderful uh, mission that's going on down there uh, with those six pastors. Uh, thinking back eight years ago when they were just starting out and just doing their training and getting ready, and uh, one of them had just returned from Haiti a few weeks back 
and they were officially, uh, well, officially ordained and officially uh, appointed into their, their charges. Not that it changed anything they were doing, but it's, uh, it's a big step. It's a big long process. And uh, they've been doing some wonderful, wonderful work down there. And it's a place that needs uh, more prayers and more help than we can imagine. So, uh, anybody have any other announcements? Joys, concerns, things we'd like to share? Yeah. Yes? Janine will be having a CT scan this coming Friday. It's just a regular, like every three months, six months, whatever it might be. But um, just hoping that everything is still good. Pray, pray that it's a regular <coughs> turnout. Okay, thank you. Others? Well, if not, let's take a moment to uh, enter into prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the uh, soft rains that have fallen upon the fields. And, and we, act, we, we, we thank you for the, the warmth uh, spreading across the grounds and watching the, uh, the seedlings coming up, watching flowers bloom, watching uh, things grow. Uh, the beauty of your creation is, is, is on full display at this time of year. Lord, we lift up those who are, who are dealing with uh, difficult prognosis, dealing with challenges. We, we lift up Janine as she goes for a checkup, that uh, things all come out well. We lift up those who, uh, who are dealing with loss in their life, who are dealing with family members who have gone on. We lift up those who are, who are still challenged by this pandemic and are dealing with, with a great difficulty. We lift up those who... Uh, who are still on the fence, whether to be vaccinated, we lift up those who are who are not yet eligible, the children and, and, and some of the people with health concerns. We uh, pray for their protection and we pray for uh, uh, government officials to make decisions that are helpful to us and helpful to all. Lord, we ask your spirit to be strong within us so that we might feel your presence among us, that we might be in right relationship to worship you this day. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let us continue worship music. join together and sing from page 127.
Please join me in our prayer of invocation. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you sent the Holy Spirit to enkindle the zeal of Christ's followers waiting in Jerusalem for his promised gift. Pour the same inspiration on your people here assembled and on the Church of Christ throughout the world. Revive the power of the gospel in our hearts, that it may be to us a sacred trust for the blessing of all creation. Enable your church to spread the good news of salvation, so that all nations may hear it in their own tongues and welcome it into their own lives. And may the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue in an attitude of prayer. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your words proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our psalm we're reading this morning is Psalm 104. We're reading verses 24 through 34 and then 35b. And what 35b means is when we get to verse 35, uh, I will read, we will skip the first part of the bold print on verse 35, and then I will read the light print, and then you will finish with the bold print on verse 35. So we'll skip the first half of verse 35. Beginning with verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things in the world are there. Living things also there go the ships, and Leviathan, whom you formed to play in. He all to you, to give them their food in due seasons. When you give to them, they gather it. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and the troubles, who touches the mountains as they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have be. May my meditation be pleasing to the Lord in whom I rejoice. Bless the soul, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Please stand. singing from page 372.
This morning we're going to do a gospel lesson and a, and a uh, epistle reading, or excuse me, it's actually going to be two epistle readings. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, well, it's, it's not exactly an epistle, it's from the book of Acts. Acts is, Acts is history, it's not, it's not a gospel, it's not an epistle. So it's somewhere in between. So this is the reading from the first four verses of the second chapter of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages the Spirit gave them ability. And from the 8th chapter of Romans, verses 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes what is for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We finally reached Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is the day we put up all the red. The reason it's the red is for the first part of the verses that I read today, the book of Acts. Pentecost was a feast, it's a Jewish feast. It was a feast, first it was a feast of the harvest, and then and then added to it was the Feast of the Law, the law that was given to Moses. So it was a big reason for people to be gathering in Jerusalem. Now, we are, we are about 10 days re removed from Pentecost. Pentecost would have been a feast that would have started 50 days after the day after Passover, which means it's... Well, Passover happened just before Easter, so it's, it's not. And it's the period of time when the, the people from all over the world who had um, Jewish background, Jewish roots, would be traveling back to Jerusalem for the purpose of this, of this celebration. And it also happened to be a period of time approximately 10 days after the ascension of Jesus after he had spent 40 days with the disciples. It is on this day that the disciples are all gathered together in that room, waiting, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and move them. Now, Jesus has breathed the Holy Spirit into them. They have the Spirit within them, but it hasn't been given direction yet, so they don't know what to do with it. They are ready, they are empowered, they are emboldened, they are... They were just waiting for instruction. And on this day, the Spirit entered into the room, and as I read, it filled them each with the ability to be able to speak, and speak in languages that they didn't know. Now, some people think this is just speaking in tongues. This is some kind of uh, strange new ability. Some people have tried to duplicate it in speaking in tongues where they, they do some kind of, I don't know, I've, I've, I've heard of churches and I've heard of, of, of religions that say if you don't have the gift of speaking in tongues, well, you're not, you're not really filled with the Spirit. And I, I'm really challenged by that because these people who were filled with the Spirit to be able to speak as of this new ability through the Spirit, they were speaking in other languages. They weren't just talking. They were talking so that others could hear them and understand them. Who were the ones that heard him? Well, let's see. There were uh, there were uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya. 
belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. That's a lot of different people speaking a lot of different languages. And all of a sudden, all these people could understand what these disciples were saying. These Galileans who spoke one language, maybe they knew a little Greek too, but they basically spoke in one language. All of a sudden, they could speak all these other languages and all these pe other people from these other places can hear them and they can understand them and they know what they are saying and they are speaking to them of Jesus Christ. They are speaking of them the good news. They are sharing this wonderful, wonderful gospel that they have witnessed and are able to be able to speak it in ways and places that they've never been able to do before. And so this is the beginning. This is the birth of the church. This is where it starts. And, they, and the people, you know, some of them say, well, what's going on? These people, these guys are all speaking the strange languages. They must be drunk. And, and Peter's the one who gets up and says, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And evidently it wasn't popular then at the time to be drinking before 9 o'clock because Peter says, they aren't drunk. It's too early in the day for them to be drunk. They are doing what God has led them to do, what Christ told them that they would do, and what the Spirit has empowered them to do. And they are sharing the Word of God. And Peter goes on to give his speech to the people who don't understand the language he's speaking. And suddenly, there are people coming to believe in Christ that had not before. Now, I mentioned a laundry list of all the people in different languages that would be able to hear them. Some of them... They said, we're Romans, both Jews and proselytes. Well, what are, what are, we know what Jews were, what are the proselytes? Well, proselytes are people who are converted from one religion to another, or one belief system to another. I'm led to believe because of the way they said it, he's talking about Jews and proselytes who had come from Rome. And that's where we get to our next reading in the eighth chapter of the letter of Paul to the Romans. Because on this day of Pentecost, we are literally 50 days after Jesus has, has, uh, has been crucified and resurrected from the grave. And we're 10 days after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And the next 20 years will be a period of time where Peter... And John will be thrown into jail, and uh, some of the other disciples will be persecuted, and uh, some will come to know them, and Stephen was stoned, and they would face great persecution from all kinds of different people, some of them from Romans, and some of them from neighbors, and some of them from Jewish leadership. One of them was Saul. You remember, Saul's the one who had Stephen stoned. The Saul, the one who got knocked off his horse on the road, on the road going to uh, uh, Damascus. Saul, the one who came to be known then also as Paul, the one who we're reading today his letter to the Romans. It is approximately 50, year 50, approximately 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it's approximately 20 years of a great deal of challenge that has been met with the growth of the church. And it has spread. And Paul is likely in his second missionary journey by now. And that missionary journey would have led him beyond the southern regions of Turkey and, and gone across that, that part of Asia. They didn't call it Turkey then. It was a bunch of different names of countries, but it was Asia Minor. And across into the northern parts of Mesopotamia and down into Greece and parts of the world that there would have been a much stronger Roman influence and many of the people that Paul had met, many of the people who may have been in Jerusalem on that Pentecost Sunday, many people who have heard the word of God through the preaching of the disciples and the word that had spread in the churches that had lived in Rome, Paul is in this journey and he's hearing back reports of what's going on in Rome while he is in that journey probably going down through Greece because there would have been a lot of 
people going back and forth between Rome and Greece. In, in Greece at that time, there were entire cities that he visited that would have been entirely inhabited by uh, Romans, people who were centurions, who had retired there and, and were, were living there. And, and the word had spread not just by the disciples to where they went, but the word had spread to where the disciples went and people heard and went to other places and spread that word. And that they heard that and then they spread the word. And there were all of these people around the known world at that time spreading into Rome that had heard something about the way of Christ. But some of what Paul was hearing evidently he didn't like because he's hearing about He's hearing about Jews that are living in, in Rome, and uh, many of them are, 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 are they are people who have been uh, captured uh, you know, years before during wars and are slaves. Uh, he is hearing about Romans who have converted to Christianity, and he is hearing about the practices that they're doing and some of the ways that they used to live that have been adapted into their new Christian life in ways that the Jews have taken some of the Jewish law and tried to force it upon those who are following Christ in Rome. And there is a battle going on in Rome, not between the Romans and the, the, the Christians, but between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, the converts, mostly citizens of Rome. And there's this dispute going on between them about how is the proper way for church to be, ha be happening. How is the right way for people to behave? Because some of the Romans are still carrying on some of their old Roman traditions, and some of them are fairly eye-opening, a little lucrative, a little uh, scandalous. And of course, the Jews have the laws that are very, very strict, although some of that has been adapted, and they've made some of their own mistakes in how they live and do things that have kind of skewed the law. And of course, both of those things are things Jesus came to try to teach us and correct us through. And Paul is writing this letter to tell them, you're still stuck in your sin. You're still wrong. You are equal. One of you is not better than the other. But you're both equally wrong. You're equally sinners. You both need to understand this is what Christ had to say. And he is writing this letter as an instruction to the people in Rome, the Christians in Rome, both, both Jews and proselytes, that are still trying to get it right. And this is the struggle that he's writing about when he, when he talks about that the Spirit helps us in his weakness. You know, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit here for now like five weeks. We started out, you know, right after Easter, we started out talking about how God was in the Old Testament through wisdom. We didn't call him Father because we didn't have Jesus as a reference point to, to think about. And we, and we talked about how Jesus was in the Old Testament through the Word, through what was spoken, because Jesus, John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and that was Jesus at the, at the outset. But we've been talking a long time about the work of the Spirit, Talk about how, how it did so many things and, and breathed life into, into the, the dead and, and, and into those who were lifeless. He, it, it moved across the waters. It's done so many things. And today we're talking about how the Spirit is working, the Spirit that came and filled the disciples at Pentecost and led them to be able to speak, and how it is done doing things through these disciples, things that they never dreamed they could do. And the word of God, the understanding of who Christ is, is spreading throughout the land. But it's not without trouble. And Paul, Paul is talking about these labor pains, this, this, these labor pains that are the birthing of the church, this beginning, this challenge, this patience that they have to have until Christ comes, until they, until they meet that end time. They're, 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 they're looking forward to the day when Christ returns. We still are. But he's recognizing the challenges that they're going through. This also happens to be Heritage Sunday, too. We've got a lot of, lot of different things we add on to this. Heritage Sunday pauses us for a moment in our reading from Romans to 
look at the challenges that they went through and how they dealt with them. Because, you know, we, we, we read during, uh, time before, uh, during, uh, during Lent, we, we read about in First Peter how Peter was, was writing to the churches that he had started in northern uh, Asia Minor and all the challenges that they were facing among the neighbors that they were living with, the people who are Greek speaking, the people who had Greek, Greek backgrounds and, and different ways, and, and the ones who were uh, led by Romans and, and the different ways that Nero had, in, had, had forced them into all kinds of problems. And, you know, the, the, the same Roman authorities are causing problems in Rome at this time because they kicked out, you know, most of the Jewish Christians out of Rome by this time. They've expelled them because of the, the fighting that's going on within the church, within Christ's churches. They stepped in and said, enough, all the, all the Roman citizen Christians can say, but all the Jewish Christians have to leave. Paul wrote letters to his churches later too through the challenges that they were facing. Uh, the, the church... Why it gained some uh, some some leniency in the Roman Empire when Constantine came into power, and uh, he he technically, for, for all intents and purposes, he legalized Christianity and made it uh, so that they didn't have to worry about the persecutions that they'd had before that because you know the leadership before them would feed them to the lions or have them arrested or do all sorts of terrible things to them, and. That was a good thing, but it created a different problem where there were people who sought political leadership through their alliances through the church. And as the Roman Empire started to uh, become less powerful through uh, the 400s and 500s, the fall of the Roman Empire, somewhere around 400 AD, why, as that changed, we started to look at the Holy Roman Empire. That was the power, the political power that came through the church and the misdirection it had by those who sought not to, well, not to lead people to Christ, but to lead people to their own good. They sought power to be able to, to be in charge. They didn't seek to promote, the, promote God. They sought to promote themselves. And that became confronted then when we get to about 1,000 A.D., 1,100, 1,200, by certain peoples that recognized that this was wrong. And they were persecuted for it. And people who tried to stand up to the Holy Roman Empire, to the, to the church that had become um, destructive, the, the, the church that had been misguided, they tried to stand up to it and it, it, it ended in their own deaths. And it wasn't until Martin Luther came along that he received protection in Germany from the leadership there, from a leader who decided he didn't want to answer to the church. He thought it'd be good for us to have our own church. And so Martin Luther starts things out to change. And the Protestant movement, the Reformation, begins and moves through Europe and ends up in ends up in England, and we have a we have a king Henry VIII who uh, he's not happy that he had to bury his brother's wife because she can't give him children, and now he wants his own. And well, Henry had his own way. He ended up with five more wives after her. But he decided for himself he's going to be the head of the church, head of the Church of England, and, and it grows and it has its own ways and changes and eventually a couple of brothers by the name of John and Charles Wesley who are part of that church determine you know we're not reaching people who are really in need and they start a holy club with George Whitefield and while they're at Oxford and, and they begin their ministry going out to the poor going out to the the people who are who are dying of alcohol poisoning who are working in the mines go out to people who who Wives and children are being abused and, and, and field preaching of all things. You know, the, the Anglican church look, look down upon them. You don't go out to the, you don't go out to the, to the streets. You don't go out to the fields and gather people to preach too. We have these nice big churches and they need to support our churches, right? But they thought, you know what? 
There are people out there that can't come to our churches. There are people out there, maybe they're on Facebook right now, but there are people out there who, they can't make it while we're having church, or they, they don't have the nice clothes to be able to come and join us in our church, or, or they may not be able to contribute to our church. And they thought, you know, this thing is bigger than just those people who can find the time and, and the value of going to a nice, pretty church. And so they took God to the streets and to the fields, and they, they missioned in America. We were, we were once the missionary field. I think we are again. But it was through their work that we ended up where we are today, with a Methodist church, became a United Methodist church. We, we struggled. We struggled in the early days in the of course, the beginning of it was trying, just trying to cross the frontier. And then the challenges that came along with, with taking sides during slavery and the church split over it. And, and uh, there was a Episcopal Method, Methodist Episcopal Church South that, that was supporting slavery and the, the other the Methodist Episcopal Church was against it. And so we went through 1800s dealing with that. And the 1900s came and we dealt with all kinds of, of challenges that had to do with women's suffrage and with, uh, with, with again, with, with alcoholism and with dealing with, with all kinds of social issues that a lot of the women's groups were formed to be able to face. The UMW today was started. I remember when it was WSCS. WSCS was, I don't remember all of the words, but it was a way for the church to reach out and help people. Salvation Army came as an outgrowth from the Methodist Church. And then we get into the 2000s, and, and while we've gone through all the social issues, now we're dealing with human sexuality and trying to, trying to show the love of God to people of different persuasions, regardless of, of who they feel they are, or what color they are, or what sex they are, or what different ways they may dress or pierce or look. It is in these challenges that we continue to have the pains. And how did they deal with them and how do we deal with them today? The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The same Spirit that entered into those disciples on Pentecost, who Paul writes about in helping the Romans work through their challenges, still available to us today. And even when we can't put the words together to describe the pain that we see, to describe the pain that we're feeling, to describe the challenges that we're faced with. Even when we can't put it together and say, Lord, I, I don't even know how I feel about this. The Spirit helps us be able to be searched by God through our hearts. And even though the words may not come out from our brain through our mouth, the words of our heart is, are lifted up to God. Our spirit is our intercessor. Our spirit is our interpreter. Our spirit is the spirit of God that allows us to be able to understand. We should always pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us when we are reading. That's, that's the prayer we read. The prayer to the Holy Spirit. The prayer, the prayer that allows us to better understand what it is God is leading us through his word. And it's in that work of the Spirit. The Spirit that the Spirit that intercedes with sighs too deep for words that helps us to know that no matter what we're going through, God is listening. No matter how we may or may not form it into a prayer, God hears us. And no matter how lonely or how difficult we may find our situation. God is there for us. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to meditate upon your words, words that lead us and guide us through the work of your Spirit. Help us, Lord, to find the right ways through that leading. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Let us go from this place to share the love of Christ and be a blessing to each other.